Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And before I get into business, uh, Think Tech is going through its springtime fundraiser. So if you like the shows on Think Tech and you want to contribute to it, go to thinktechhawaii.com and drop a nickel in the, in the machine there. Uh, we appreciate it. Keep our shows going. We've got some hardworking staff behind the computers and the and the mixers and stuff that uh, that like getting a paycheck. So we'd like to keep them paid. Anyway, today's show is um, kind of a, a catch up from last week. We um, we had some issues with some of the slides, internal issues, and so we didn't didn't post the show to. Uh, YouTube like we usually do and we think we've resolved that we're going to run through basically the same um, subject matter as last week but I want to add a little bit of emphasis to it you know I have um, a recurring guest Dan Goen who I had to beg actually for almost a year to come on my show and he finally relented and now I can't get rid of him even if I wanted to but I don't want to um, and the, the idea is he he has a, a really big um and close up view vantage point of global energy and economics and and even things behind the scene that like um, computer software that runs systems like electric grids and and insurance companies and things like that he's, he's a rather unique personality and what we're trying to do with, with when I have him on the show is to give people a kind of an advanced picture of where things are going that may not even be visible on the business news networks or or whatever on TV. And so I think he's a really important guest and and we have some uh, important information that we like to put out for people to think about. We're not trying to drive a particular outcome or a particular opinion or, or vantage point. We're just trying to say, here's the reality of the world. And, and a lot of times people that get confronted by things like um, economic policy and stuff, don't understand where those policies come from, but Dan does, and he'll cite the source and he'll say, here's where, here's where it exists. Here's where it comes from. Things like the petrodollar we talked about late last year, you know, and it gives you a better perspective on what's going on behind the scenes when you have things like the Ukraine invasion and, and such, and you have inflation and, and things like that happening in our country. So the, the, um, Basically, sub subtitle of this story today is um, Pitbull Diplomacy. And I put that on there as an attention getter to um, to uh, what's going on with the invasion of Ukraine. You know, in the world, there's different ways to solve international disputes or, or international disagreements. The worst one being war and invasion. I mean, even as a retired general, I can tell you that most generals don't think war is such a great thing. It's expensive. It's wasteful, it's brutal, it's ugly, uh, and we don't want it. It's, you know, military guys aren't warmongers. They know what it, the real cost is, and it's usually in their friends and, and their own families that they have to worry about it. And that's a perspective that Dan and I come from on this. But the reality is that whether it's economic warfare or, or military warfare or political warfare, it all gets pretty ugly. And some people are better at it. They're more like Dalmatians and 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 maybe uh, um, Irish setters, but some people are like put pit bulls, and we're watching a pit bull uh, in Ukraine right now, and it causes some problems. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But the bottom line is, um, and we can start throwing the slides up right now. Actually, next slide. Government policies do matter, and. You have a role as a citizen in determining, in this country anyway, determining who runs your government and what policies they put out. And it all starts with your personal habits, what you like, what you don't like, what you're willing to accept and not accept. And then it's also a requirement for citizens to be informed. I think one of the, the most critical deficits we have in our society today is we don't have people that really spent time studying history in school or paying attention to it. I certainly, when I went to elementary and, and intermediate school, I was not into history at all. And it wasn't until after I got into college that I really gained, got an, gained an appreciation for history. And when I got in the military, I gained, gained a serious understanding of the importance of history. So if you don't study history, you're definitely doomed to repeat it. That's an old quote. I'm sure it's claimed by several people. But trade policies matter. And 
debt matters and energy really, really matters in today's world. People don't understand how important the energy that we use today, the fossil fuel that we use today is needed. And the fact that you can't just shut it off and say, we need to go green. Um, there's huge implications on how you make that transition. And that's where I think Dan gives us a lot of great insight because there's other implications to shutting off the oil spigot and natural gas spigot and saying, we're just gonna go with windmills and solar panels. So Dan, welcome back to the show. Good to have you on. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to you and, uh, and let you kind of get off and run it. Sure, thank you, Stan. Uh, so I can uh, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so what that is, it's a slide that shows the, the amount of natural gas uh, production uh, per day and consumption per day. So for example, in the case of Europe, Europe consumes 31 billion cubic meters of gas per day. Uh, Asia Pacific consumes 20 billion cubic meters of gas per day. Uh, the production coming out of Africa is 7 billion cubic meters of gas per day. United uh, North America is 8 billion cubic meters of gas per day. The Middle East produces 12 billion cubic meters of gas per day and Russia produces 24 billion cubic meters of gas per day. Um, in addition to that, Russia also exports uh, about 4.5 uh, million barrels of oil uh, is sent into Europe on a daily basis. So uh, as far as world capacity, the world does not have the capacity to replace the Russian gas moving into Europe. Uh, for example, the United States, if we were to replace it, we would have to increase our natural gas system infrastructure by three times. That's not just the compressors and pumping stations down in Louisiana that fill the ships. That's all we'd have to have enough pipelines here in the United States, the obviously the compressor facilities down in Louisiana, but we'd also have to increase the ship fleet by three times. All that equipment does not exist, and nobody has the ability to replace uh, Russia's gas. Uh, in addition to that, a uh, shortage of 4.5 million barrels of oil today. Uh, the reason why you're seeing a lot of the energy prices is because the world production of oil and the world consumption of oil are closely matched. It's roughly right around 100 billion barrels every day of oils produced and consumed. If you remove 4.5 million barrels of that, nobody has enough excess capacity to replace that, uh, that crude oil. Um, right now, what they're forecasting is Russia currently is shutting in about 3 million barrels a day of oil production. And by the month of May, well, first of all, once this oil shut in, what happens with wells is it's sort of like tar. If it's not flowing, it sort of builds up in there. It'll take them at least three years to clear up those wells, put them back into production. So we won't see that oil for three years. The United States may be able to produce another million barrels of oil a day, maybe the Middle East another million barrels of oil a day. The point being is there's no way to replace Russian oil. In fact, uh, the OPEC uh, ministers just got together and told the EU yesterday that if you did a full sanction on Russia, that nobody has the ability to replace something like 7 million barrels of oil every day. So that's just the truth there. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, Russia two years ago, de-dollarize their economy. What that means is they have no treasure bills in reserves. Uh, whenever they were saying that they froze Russia's uh, currency reserves, those reserves were actually dollar reserves of Russian corporations. The Russian government itself ha has no dollars in reserves. They have more gold in reserve um, than they, well, they, you see there, they've got yuan, they've got euro, they've got gold uh, and a number of other currencies. And that gives value to the ruble uh, and we're going to talk uh, about the, the the whole issue uh, when it comes to central banking and using gold as a reserve to back your currency. So, um, and to pay for commodities like oil, natural gas, wheat, fertilizer, everything. Uh, one of the things that happened is when we took uh, Russia out of the SWIFT system, uh, the ruble went from roughly uh, 80 rubles to a dollar. It jumped up to another 180 rubles to a dollar, meaning it was a crash of their economy. Russia turned around and pegged the ruble to gold. I understand Russia has the second and third largest gold mines in the world. The, within hours, the ruble went from 180 rubles all the way back down to 80 rubles a dollar, and it's been stable since then. And since then, since last Friday, Russia has unpegged 
the ruble from uh, from gold, right? They're letting free floating, but understand the Russian central bank still has access to the world's second and third largest gold mines just to feed it right into the central bank. And I'll explain later why that's why that's important. Uh, if I can get you to go to the next slide, please. Okay. So uh, what's going on here? Uh, so this was uh, headline news about two weeks ago. Uh, the truth is, if you go back and look at the Chinese uh, SIP system, or more specifically, the Asian Development Bank, it's the development bank that uh, that the Saudi uh, that the China uses for the Belt and Road Initiative. If you go back and look at the records, it'll tell you that Saudi Arabia has been a member of the SIPS financial system since 2018. So this point here, uh, it may be news to the Western media, but the truth is the Saudis have had futures contracts in the Shanghai uh, Futures Oil Exchange since 2018, ever since they joined the SIPS financial system. So Saudi Arabia can trade their oil for yuan. Yeah, with no yeah. problem. Well, they they're selling futures on the exchange on the sharing sure. Ever like I said, they if you go to the uh, the Asian Development Bank, the records are out there free for everybody to see. You pull it down, it'll say Saudi Arabia has been a member since 2018, and there's records in there of all the different of the futures contracts that Saudi Arabia has been selling on the exchange since 2018. So the Saudis are already doing it today. So that's not new. Everybody thinks it's new. But if you just do your homework, you'll you'll find it. It's the Asian Development Bank there in Saudi Arabia. Uh, if I can get to go to the next one, please. Okay. So why would Saudi Arabia consider this? Okay. So if you take a good look at that chart there, uh, original my original chart was from the IMF, uh, but this is a, a a chart that we went ahead and we uh, we reformatted it so it's a little bit easier to read. If you really look at the top, you'll see the lowest cost per this is the break even cost of producing crude oil. In the case of Iran, it's about roughly about fifteen dollars a barrel. They're one of the lowest produ lowest cost producers of oil in the world, and you can see Russia's there. They're about twenty twenty five dollars a barrel. Uh, but if you go down and look at Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia's break even is eighty eighty uh, between eighty and eighty four dollars a barrel. What that means is between twenty fourteen and twenty twenty when oil here in the United States was averaging about $50, $55 a barrel, Saudi Arabia was losing $30 in every barrel. Now, how they were found financing it, and it took me a little digging to do it, goes back to that Asian Development Bank there in China. And there's records in there, and basically the Asian Development Bank, they've been loaning money to Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is deeply in debt to the Chinese, and that's why they're reacting a lot of the ways that they are. So whenever you give them a call and you say, I need for you to produce production, they won't call you back. That's because they're deeply in debt to the Chinese. And they're already part of that whole financial system that's opening up there in Asia. Next place, Pete. Next, there you go. So this is a depiction from the Belt and Road Initiative. Those uh, black marks you see there, those are, it's a combination of freeways and rail systems that the Chinese have been building over the last 10 years. Uh, you also see maritime uh, routes there that's over the ocean. Uh, and there's also a pipeline system that goes through southern Iran and links up there at the Pakistan border there at Gadara City. Okay, notice that part of uh, um, China's maritime route that none of those routes go into the Persian Gulf. The reason why is because when they built that pipeline there in, um, when they built the, this is the Gorham Jaskut pipeline there in southern Iran. It, like I said, it meets up there at Ghadar City there in southern Pakistan. Uh, there's a mega oil refinery there. Uh, the Chinese and the Rush, uh, the, the Chinese and the Saudis are, have went into building that, that, that new, uh, the new oil refinery. The, it's a 50 50 partnership between Saudi Arabia and China. And uh, the reason why there's no maritime route there is because what they're planning on is not shipping any oil through the Persian Gulf. They're going to be pipelining all the oil out of the Middle East, uh, probably up to that uh, new refinery there at Gadara City, and be shipping uh, refined products through either uh, pipelines, gas pipelines, pipelines, train, truck, you know, however they're, however they're going to ship it. And, uh, and I would say with the maritime uh, routes on that chart, they also, every place they touch land is a place where China has helped to build a port. Yeah, got a port base, there. Yeah. And basically pretty much has full leverage over that country for what yep. can go in and out of that port. 
So yeah. every place you see where that touches in a country other than China, China has a say in what goes on there. Yeah, the coloring, the coloring in that map, you see the uh, every every colored country. That's where China has hooks, financial hooks into some country. Uh, it's a uh, it's a type of diplomacy um, that China has practiced for probably well over a thousand years. Uh, China doesn't like to military engage with uh, with other countries. They'd rather control you through financial and and business means, and that's just how how they uh that, that's a really important point dan i'm glad you brought that out yeah um as far as the there's an economic union with amongst all those countries it's called the eurasian economic union it's a free trade zone the members of it are russia kazakhstan belarus serbia armenia kyrgyzstan china and vietnam and they're probably adding um uh, india saudi arabia um iran and m most of the middle east will be added to it um, and there's also talks of Thailand. We'll see how it all plays out. But uh, but this is a, a a union that they've been forming for for quite a while. If I can get you to go to the next one, please. Okay. SIP's banking system. Um, the banking system that the uh, um, that the Chinese put together. Um, it was started in, in 2017. Uh, the first oil futures contract to trade on Shanghai Exchange was March 26, 2018. It was with Iran. So China has been buying oil from Iran uh, since uh, since 2018. And of course, they've been buying oil from Saudi Arabia since then. As far as uh, member countries, uh, Saudi Arabia is a member, Iraq's a member, Turkey's a member, Iran's a member, Pakistan, India, um, most of the countries you see, uh, and you can see that there's a quite a long list there of uh, all the different uh, banks uh, around the world that are part of that system. And the number of banks in, in Asia and, um, and uh, the Russian area, it's it's in the hundreds. Uh, yeah. But even here in North America, we're in the, uh, with North America 28, South America 17, and the Pacific Island nations um, like Cook Islands, French Polynesia, wherever that's that's even got 22 banks in the system. And so basically what this does is that when the US imposes sanctions on countries and starts squeezing them, um, that normally means because the US dollars reserve currency that we can put pressure on countries to do things economically, um, kind of leveraging um, our strength in our dollar against their country. But this SIP system, takes them out of our ability to really leverage them in, in at least on the banking side. So we, it, it takes a tool out of our tool chest to try and get them to come into alignment of whatever policies the U.S. wants to press. How, how that system works is it assumes that uh, the U.S. dollar is the center of the system. And uh, one of the things I know I showed Chan, Stan is uh, there's a place called the Bureau of International Settlements, the BIS. It's a, that's a central bank of central banks. It's in Switzerland, here in Basel, Switzerland. And one of the things uh, I have the computers do is I download this. Uh, this uh, Basically, it's a spreadsheet from them. And it's basically the values of other currencies relative to the dollar. So, for example, uh, uh, for example, it might be $1 equals 120 yen, as an example, or maybe one dollar equals 80 rubles or something like that so that system assumes that the dollar is in the middle so if you're going to convert one currency to another currency you convert your currency to dollars and the dollars to the other currency so the system assumes that the dollar is in the middle and it is one there is an alternative way of doing the same thing and it involves using gold and in that system it's not based on one dollar it's based off of one troy ounce of gold and we'll step into that to here and I'll show you how this other new system is evolving and why it's evolving that way. Next next slide, please. Okay, uh, the, the BRIC countries, that's, that's uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, the reason why this new system is evolving that way is because um, the United States primarily, our export product is pretty much the dollar. Uh, we don't really export anything. These countries you're looking at export a lot of goods around the world, either raw goods or finished goods. And uh, there's been an amount of consternation about the dollar and the fact that uh, uh, that we issue out dollars. We we give them dollars for their goods, right? And uh, 
And over time, there's been questions as to our economic viability has to do with our debt. Now, part of this has to do with how this system works. Uh, dollars in our system is actually loaned into existence. So the dollar is actually a debt instrument. Our treasuries are a debt instrument and other instruments are based off of our debt, right? And so to get our economy to expand, we have to increase, we have to increase, have, expand the credit. And therefore that expands the number of dollars into existence. But these countries have been asking for quite a while what value does it provide to us other than an inter intermediate form of exchange? And that's resulting in sort of a collision of, of two worlds of what value is. And uh, I guess we'll go to the last page, I think. Okay, implications, world trade and currency exchange rates if the dollar is the status. Okay, so what is this all based on? Well. There at the, the Bureau of International Settlements, there's a document called the uh, Basel Frameworks, and it's about a 1600 page uh, rule book on banks and what banks have to use for what's called reserves. So for uh, a bank note, like the Federal Reserve note, like the dollar that we use, that's a bank note, for it to have value, the bank itself has to have reserves to show that it has value. So for example, when I showed you that pie chart where the ruble that 20 percent of the ruble was backed by gold that, that that's what we're talking about okay well in that document on page 192 it states the following however at national discretion gold bullion held in own vaults or on and an allocated basis to the extent backed by bullion liabilities can be treated as cash and therefore risk weighted at zero percent in addition, cash items in the process of collection or otherwise are to be risk weighted at 20%. So what that means is that for fiat currencies are risk weighted at 20%. What that means is if let's say I have a bank and I have 100 million euros in my bank, I can only regard 80 million of them as my reserves because there's a risk of holding that currency. But if I have gold, gold bullion in my vault to my bank, that has zero risk of holding that as a reserve. So the reason why there's a collision of minds here is because those a Asian societies are very old societies and they value gold. And one of the things uh, they did last couple of years putting a base of three is they had that paragraph put into the banking rule. And so though all those banks are amassing gold for the central banks and that's backing their currencies. Unfortunately, here in the United States, I, our central bank does have some gold, but our our bonds and our currency is not redeemable in gold versus China's currency, Russia's currency, all those other currencies are redeemable in gold. So for example, when uh, Russia was taken out of the SWIFT system and the ruble crashed 180 rubles to a dollar, they pegged it to gold, they quickly recovered back to 80, 80 rubles a dollar. And the reason why is because there's still a good part of the world that considers gold a reserve currency and as as a point as point it's actually in the bureau of international settlements basal framework as far as the legal document that governs banks internationally and that's what it says that gold bullion is a zero risk asset so now how does it risk the uh, um, the united states as the as a reserve currency well i just stated to you that any fiat currency has a 20 percent risk so a lot of those central banks, rather than putting dollars on their balance sheets to back their current their fiat currencies, they're switching out dollars for gold bullion is what they're doing because it has zero risk. And right now that's setting up a situation and here's what, what the debate is amongst the traders. I don't know how this will play out, but let me explain this to you. And there's basically three different points here. One is, for, uh, and they're giving here an example, so let's say, for example, China. China has something like $3.4 trillion worth of treasuries in reserves. So China sells U.S. treasuries to buy Russian commodity. Since the Russians have some dollar-based debt, that they might do that, right? Um, they might be exchanged with the Russians in some other ways, but we'll see how that plays out. The problem is, if the, the Chinese start selling off our treasuries, what that does that causes the price of the treasuries to go down, the interest rates to go up. Um, but that will also flood our system with that many more dollars in circulation here in the United States. So it'll cause 
our inflation to go up and, and the interest rates, and that'll have a, a pretty hard impact. It'll slow the economy down and, uh, and have some pretty hard impacts on, on we Americans here. Uh, but the other point is, the third point is, uh, what it means is uh, because we basically force more of the commo- Russia's commodity trade onto the, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, 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 trade system, they're the SIP system, they're in the futures market and the different commodities market. The yuan will over time become a commodity backed currency, backed by hard goods, hard things, and not uh, not based on debt. So it's a, a collision of two worlds uh, in the central banking world. Now, uh, last week, whenever um, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell was up speaking in front of Congress, when he said that we're moving into a world where you could have multiple reserve currencies, that is what he was talking about. Just because okay. of the situation is setting. And quickly, Dan, could you just talk a little bit about, you know, our national debt and the relation of debt to GDP and how that fits into this process? We've got about a minute left. Yeah. Well, it's very simple. When we have high amounts of debt, that debt weighs on the value of our currency. So the dollar is worth less because of our debt. In order for the dollar to rise in value, we need to do a bunch of things to make it. Number one is not hold as much national debt as we have to increase the value of it. The other is is to uh, uh, gather some wealth, do like what these other countries are, and that is put some either less less risk weighted assets behind the, the the Federal Reserve or or add gold to the Federal Reserve or something to reduce the amount of risk to increase the value of the dollar. So reducing the debt it will, will help uh, increase the value of the dollar. Yeah. So where, where the U.S. used to have a leadership role in in a lot of policy things worldwide, you know, a lot of things that the U.S. has always done to support, you know, nation building or to support um, fa- uh, famine, getting rid of famine in countries and things like that, we're kind of losing that potential because we are putting ourselves financially behind the eight ball by having so much debt. And that debt starts with the individuals buying more than they can afford, buying bigger houses than they can afford to buy, uh, betting that they'll increase in value and, and all that stuff. But we're, we basically put our whole country's stability at risk. And as far as we can see, Dan and I look at this, and we talk about it all the time, this quote unquote transitory inflation isn't transitory. It's going to be here for a while, and it could potentially get very, very ugly. So, Dan, just the last 30 seconds, what was the Consumer Price Index uh, announcement yesterday? The, the, CPI that came, uh, the CPI today came at 8.5%. 8, 8. Has and it ever been that high before in your lifetime? Not since the 80s. Not since yeah. the 80s. Last time we had this, and Paul Volcker jacked interest rates to 20% to kill it. But the yeah. other thing, what Dan and I are talking about is the reason why you're seeing high inflation it's it's not because it's not a monetary problem. It's because the it's because the dollar and its value relative to those goods and is showing up in the commodities market. So it requires more and more of our currency to buy the same commodity. Right. So that leads us to the end of today's Stan Energy Man. A little bit complicated, a little bit big picture, but what we're trying to do is get you that big picture and help people understand that. We're part of a, a bigger world than just the U.S. or just Hawaii, and we need to understand what we do, the decisions we make, the state policies we make, the national policies we make, and what that does to our own personal lives. So thanks for joining Dan and I today on Stand the Energy Man, and we'll see you uh, next Tuesday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram. 
Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.